Please remain standing and turn to page one for the invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. <coughs> Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, our refuge and strength, the author of all godliness, by your grace hear the prayers of your church. Grant that those things which we ask in faith we may receive for your bountiful mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading for the 20th Sunday after Pentecost is from Habakkuk, beginning in chapter 1. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abound. Therefore, the law is paralyzed, and justice never prevails. The wicked him and the righteous of that justice is perverted. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I have to give to his complaint. Then the, Lord's repli the Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it uh, plain on tablets, so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. See, he is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous will live by his faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thank you again, choir. Uh, it's good to have them back, isn't it? Amen? Uh, they took their summer off, and they're back, and we're grateful for that. And we'll hear from them again, and then soon they'll be singing uh, one sun One of these Sundays real soon they'll be singing with the children's choir as well. But well, thank you so much this morning. Our second reading uh, this morning is from Paul's letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy, the first chapter. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I am persuaded thou lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord, or ashamed of me, his prisoner. But join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time but has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed, because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. What you have heard from me, keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand once again for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Gospel according to St. Luke, the 17th chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause people to sin are bound to come, but woe to that person for whom they come. It would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around his neck than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. So watch yourselves if your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, Forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after sheep. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now, sit down to eat? Would he not rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So I tell you also, I, so I, you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants who have only done our duty. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to thee, O Christ. We join together in confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, 
begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated and we'll sing together our sermon hymn. For those of you that were here during the month of August, you may recall we looked each week in August at well, four of the apostles, Paul, Peter, Matthew, and Andrew, how each one of them individually had a life-changing encounter with the risen Lord. And when they met the Lord Jesus Christ after the resurrection, their lives were changed, never to be the same again. Not only were they transformed, but they began to impact others whose lives were transformed by the power of the gospel. The evidence is overwhelming as you read the book of Acts, but especially as you read Acts chapter 2 when you see that 3,000 people were changed by the power of the gospel on the day of Pentecost and were baptized into Christ. The point we've been looking at these last several weeks is that as lives are changed, living conditions change, and as the apostles went out and proclaimed Christ, as they went out and proclaimed the gospel, as they went out and did good in his name, it had a major transforming influence over their world. And we're going to look at today at how they continued uh, through their charitable deeds to transform the world to Christ. Let us pray. Father, 
we would ask this morning that you'd speak to us in your word. Lead us by your Holy Spirit into all truth. We pray that the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts, would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the things you notice about our country is that Americans have always been a charitable people. It's woven in the very fabric of our society, the very core of our being. And it seems that whether times are good or bad, Americans always open their hearts and their wallets to help people in need. Whether it's the person next door, down the road, or halfway around the world. Whether it's a friend or a foe, Americans always seem to be willing to help people in need. Natural disaster, flood, uh, tsunami, earthquake, no matter what the disaster, we always seem to respond in love and give generously. We help people we don't even know. What is it that motivates us to give to people we will never meet, whose faces would recognize? The reality is we don't know their faces, but we recognize the face of suffering. And we see people in need. We want to help. Now, I have to tell you that it's amazing to me that this is true. And the reason is because being charitable, being compassionate toward others is alien to our fallen nature. It's antithetical to our fallen, rebellious nature, which looks out for me. So what accounts for the generosity? What accounts for the compassion of the American people? I believe it's something that's been passed down from previous generations. It's something that's part of our heritage. I think a lot of that we attribute to our faith, our faith in the Bible, our faith in Christ, our Savior. And it's something that's been passed down. One of the things I want you to notice, if you turn back to your bulletin this morning, and Paul's letter to Timothy. Because this is um, verse 5. He says, Paul writing to Timothy says, I'm reminded, Timothy, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded now lives in you also. What I want to point out there real quickly is that Timothy, early on, as Paul is still writing letters and preaching, Timothy is a third generation Christian. He's saying this faith was passed down from grandma to your mother and now it lives in you. And, and that transforming gospel is passed down from generation to generation to this day. We're here as living proof of that. Not only the faith in Christ, but the good deeds that Christ demonstrated that he modeled for his disciples. Lives to this day. You see the early disciples, they took Jesus seriously. They took his word seriously. Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. They understood that there was something generous about those early Christians. They looked at Jesus' example and they followed. Even when Jesus ascended into heaven, the good works that he did continued on long after his departure. You see, the witness of scripture is this, that Jesus went around doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil because God was with him. He went around do doing good to those that were ill. Scripture also says he left us an example that we should follow in his footsteps. You and I as Christians that profess Christ follow his example and, and we show kindness to others in need, regardless of who they are. Charity, which is a hallmark of American life in the very beginning. Americans give billions to charity annually, most of which is aimed, not always, but most of which is aimed at alleviating human suffering. This is part of our national heritage. This is part of our faith heritage as Christians. That this, the influence of the gospel, the influence of the church has transformed our culture as well. Whether it's an earthquake in Japan, it doesn't matter. We always seem to be part of help. But that's not always been true. Because if you go back before the Christian era, if you go back prior to the birth of Christ, prior to the advancement of his gospel, Charity was alien in most pagan cultures around the world. It doesn't matter where you go. Charity as we know it, charity as we define it, charity as we practice it today was not universal. Hardship and suffering, now those were universal. But not so with charity. In the pagan Roman world, for example, charity uh, as we define it today it was, not, it was non-existent. Charity was simply helping somebody with the understanding that person helped, that, person receiving aid would pay back in kind. Christian charity was given to anyone regardless of his needs, no strings attached, expecting nothing in return. It was a revolutionary concept in this day to give, to give charitably 
expecting nothing in return. Early Christians were inspired and motivated by the words of Jesus and his apostles. Those early believers understood it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. That was, a, that was so contrary to the world around them. The early Christians found themselves in a very callous, compassionless culture in those early days. But unlike the pagan world around them, they showed the genuine care for people, for the weak, the sick, the downtrodden, the dying, even at the risk of their own lives. And I was reading this week that back in, in this time, in this ancient world, if a person got sick with a wasting disease, a, a communicable disease, the family, friends, neighbors would not run to their aid. They would run for cover because they didn't want to catch the same disease. That was so antithetical to what the Christians did, who intervened, who went and helped the weak, the infirm, the dying, even at great risk themselves. According to the Roman culture of that era, the kind, that kind of charitable behavior defied common sense. It was seen as a sign of weakness to be charitable. It was viewed with great suspicion. The Roman culture, the Roman philosophy, the Roman idea was uh, nothing is to be gained by expending time and energy on the weak on the people and in, in the infirm. That's so counter to what the Christians practiced. They did it because they were honoring Jesus, not only by the message they proclaimed, but by the deeds they performed. You see, when you look at the model that Jesus left, the example that he wants us to follow, he went around and he proclaimed the good news of life and salvation as a free gift of God's grace. But he also was compassionate about human suffering. He alleviated physical suffering and he healed the sick. That ministry of caring for the sick, for the infirm, for the dying continued to live on through his apostles and it changed the world. But not so in the pagan world. You see, in the Greek world as well as in the Roman world, people, they were free men and they were slaves. Non-citizens were defined as having no purpose. If you were a, a, a slave, if you were an artisan, if you were a manual laborer, and they despised manual labor, they despised work. We'll talk more about that next week that those people in that classification had no useful purpose. No purpose at all. Hence, they were not worthy of help and aid when their lives were in jeopardy. In their dire condition, they received no food or physical protection. Fielding Garrison, a physician and historian, says that before the birth of Christ, the spirit towards sickness and misfortune was not one of compassion. And crediting, uh, but he says, the credit of ministering to human suffering on an extended scale belongs to Christianity. Christian values have so permeated society that even now in our day, there, there are some say, hey, I can be kind and charitable without religion. That may be true, but what they don't understand, what some people don't understand, it's Christian values, it's Christian virtue that has taught them how to be charitable. They forget the source of the origin of their, their decency, and it comes to Christ and his gospel. Historically, what I think is noticeable about Christian charity, above all, is that it's always been voluntary. Always voluntary. The aid and the assistance that the early church gave, whether nursing the sick and dying, feeding the poor and the starving, rescuing and abandoning ch or abandoned children, was all done voluntarily. In light of the church being outlawed in its day in Rome, despite being persecuted, even membership in a church was voluntary. Thus, each individual had to make a deliberate decision whether to join the church or not, whether such membership was worth a potential persecution or imprisonment or even death. Everything the Christians did, they did voluntarily. When they proclaimed Christ, they did it without cost, they did it without payment. When they did charitable deeds, it was without cost or expecting anything in return. The good news is, as we learn through history, Christians helping the poor did not end in the early church. It did not even end for that matter in the Middle Ages because churches today, even in our day, continue to offer aid to the poor in the United States. And we see it all the time in, in our own church and other denominations around the country. Often collect funds to give clothing, food, and medical relief for the poor. For people they don't even know, far beyond our, our national boundaries, because when it, comes to, when it comes to need, when it comes to charity, when it comes to the gospel, there are no boundaries, there are no borders. Jesus defined our neighbors, anyone in need, and that's what the early church understood. A person is our neighbor if that person is in need, regardless of their ethnicity or their background. 
so it's because of this great influence of Christ and his gospel that America has become charitable as a way of life from the very beginning it's been that way. 50 years after the nation came into being, Alexis de Tocqueville visited the United States and he wrote a book titled Democracy in America. And de Tocqueville uh, 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 astutely observed this. He said, if an accident happens on a highway, everybody hastens to help the sufferer. If some great and sudden calamity befalls a family, the purses of thousands of strangers are at once willingly open, and small but numerous donations pour in to relieve their distress. De Tocqueville saw something unique and different about the United States. Now, it's not, in our, it's not in our DNA that's something we're taught. Charity is something we, we're taught, something that's passed down from generation to generation, from grandmother to mother to children and so on. De Tocqueville saw the goodness of America and its generosity. De Tocqueville was quoted one time as saying, America is great because America is good. If America ceases to be good, it will cease to be great. A sobering reminder to us today. Now, in, in our culture, in our day today, we don't use the word pagan much anymore. We don't describe people, oh, they're a bunch of pagans. We use words like maybe non-believer. Uh, some might define themselves, for example, as an agnostic or maybe as an atheist or secularist. But whatever you want to call these people who don't believe, there are many people who want to somehow deny, deny the influence of the church, say, for example, in Western civilization, that the charity that I'm talking about this morning has nothing whatsoever to do with Christ and the church, nothing could be further from the truth. There would not be charity as we understand without Christ and his gospel, because that is, a very, that is the very heart of the gospel, is showing good to those that are in need. But there are people who want to have a revisionist history, a rewrite history in a way that, de that defies the facts. So they want to uh, divorce, if you will, the church from society and say there's no influence here. In fact, many of these revisionists, it's kind of interesting. I'll give you one point as, a, as an aside. When you and I were growing up, we understood that Christ's life was the dividing point of history. In fact, the two eras, B.C., before Christ, A.D., Anno Domini in the Latin, and the year of our Lord. That was a designation that we've used that designation as, as, as the two great eras. But now, in order to revise history, the secular mind has come up with new designations. Not B.C., before Christ, but B.C.E., before the Common Era, or the Common Era. This is revisionist history so as to extract the church and its influence from history. The reality is that the church has been very influential in, in, in the world, transforming the world one heart, one life at a time. It's irrefutable. Now, I understand that some secularists will point out the wrong that has been done in Jesus' name. I understand that. There are people you and I know throughout the annals of, of church history that people have done wrong and killed in Jesus' name. That is wrong, we denounce it. And I have to tell you, those who do evil in Jesus' name will give an account to him one day. But the fact that some lughead does evil in Jesus' name does not negate the fact that the church of Jesus Christ has founded more missions of mercy, more institutions of mercy than any other organization. The fact that some have done evil, even using a sword in Jesus' name, does not nullify the good done by Christ and his apostles of his church. George Grant states, as missionaries circled the globe after Columbus, they established hospitals, they founded orphanages, they started rescue missions, they built alms houses, they opened up soup kitchens, they incorporated charitable societies, they changed the laws, they demonstrated love, they lived as though people mattered. To divorce a church from influencing and transforming society is to divorce oneself from reality. They changed laws, they demonstrated love, they lived as though people mattered. That's our heritage as a Christian church, to live as though people mattered. Not only do we proclaim Christ, but we relieve human suffering in Jesus' name. So when you see relief coming, it's always to the glory of God in Jesus' name when you see great deeds of charity. Genuine Christian charity to the poor, the sick, the orphan, the aged, that's our heritage. It's been passed down from generation to generation. We learned that from the early disciples who learned it by Jesus' example and by his exhortation. To be charitable and kind. You see, the early church understood, and as I've mentioned repeatedly over the last several weeks, 
they changed their world. They changed the culture. They, they changed how people treated one another in Rome. And it, and it took three centuries to see that kind of an impact. You know the old saying that Rome wasn't built in a day? Well, it wasn't transformed in a day either. It took them time. But I want to tell you, they never gave up. You changed a world, one heart, one life at a time. As we look at our culture, we're living in a secular, non-believing culture. It, it, it's as though Christians are outsiders looking in oftentimes. And many can throw their hands up in despair and disgust. But I want to tell you, they did change the world, one heart, one life at a time. What God did in the first century, God can do in the 21st century. Change our, our culture, one heart, one life at a time. Beginning right here, let us pray. Father, help us not to be satisfied with mediocrity in our walk and our faith, but to live day by day with the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus and the life everlasting. Amen. We're going to call on the ushers at this time to receive our tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Father, we confess to you today as our great creator that you've created us in all that exists by your word of power. And by the same word of power, you sustain all things. We praise you, O God, that day by day you provide exceedingly abundantly for all, uh, all of our needs, above all that we could even ask or think. For all that you've given to us, we give you heartfelt thanks and gratitude. We give you thanks for the gift of life that you've given to us in and we also praise you, O God, our Redeemer. We thank you that you have redeemed us in Christ our Savior, not with silver and gold, but with his precious blood. And now, having been bought by his blood, we live for your glory and honor. We pray, Heavenly Father, that though we are saved by grace, we are saved unto good works, which you have prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Father, we pray this day that you would help us to live a life that is fully pleasing to you. We pray, Lord Jesus, that as you have less, left us an example, that you'd give us the power of your Holy Spirit to follow in your footsteps, to go around doing good, proclaiming Christ, and helping those in need. Father, we thank you for, the, for all that you've given to us, for the work you're doing in our lives, and what you've done in the past, what you're doing today, what you shall continue to do until the day when Christ comes again. On that day when he comes, we will be faultless, without spot or blemish, rejoicing in his presence. Until that day, Heavenly Father, help us to be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in Jesus our labor is never in vain. We pray, Heavenly Father, for the example of, of Paul, uh, of Timothy, and his mother and grandmother li being lived out in our lives, that that faith in Christ has passed from generation to generation. And Lord, even now as we have new generations of babies being baptized into Christian faith, we pray for moms and dads, for grandparents to live out that faith before them, to live an example. Father, we pray that in being an example for our children, we'd never cause one of those little ones to stumble. But Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to be stepping stones to bring others to Christ. Lord, this morning we pray for those that are ill in need of your healing touch, that you be merciful and compassionate to those who have been sick, we pray especially for Austin Sina. Although home from Children's Hospital, 
We pray for continued healing and recovery. We pray also this morning for Dylan Ellis, continue to be hospitalized at Children's in Milwaukee. Father, be his, his strength, be his great physician, be his healer and his savior. Draw near to me, seek you with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. Father, thank you that you do hear and answer prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our service now continues in the very bottom of page 5. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection up to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and saying, Lord, remember us when you come into your kingdom and teach us ever to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to